Welcome to the Coalition of Black Excellence Spotlight Series, where we highlight trailblazing businesses and nonprofits dedicated to elevating the Black community. Hi everyone, my name is Robin Cross. I'm one of the CBE Virtual Program Volunteers. Very excited to have everyone here today for our Impact Nonprofit Spotlight of Success Centers. Um, I've been a volunteer with CBE since 2017 and in my day job I work for ABD Insurance where I do uh, workplace wellness consulting and workers compensation claim strategy. Uh, so very excited to be able to take time from uh, my virtual work day to welcome Liz Jackson Simpson, who is the executive director and CEO of Success Centers. Um, so Liz, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're very happy um, to bring you back because many people may not know, but Success Centers was actually recognized. Um, as CBE's Impact Nonprofit of the Year um, during our Summit 19. So um, it's been a year since we've really been able to connect with success centers, but excited to learn more about, you know, the organization for those who aren't familiar. So thank you. Well, thank you for having us. And it's uh, been truly an honor to be recognized by um, our own community. Um, it's very rare that um, we get recognition as nonprofits because, but we do our, the work we do for the folks that we serve. But to be recognized and noticed by your own community is truly an honor. So thank you for having us today and thank you for the recognition. Absolutely. So for those who are not familiar, could you maybe tell us a little bit about who you are, Liz? You know, you're a Bay Area native um, and your connection to this work and how you got involved with Success Centers? Yes, my pleasure. Um, yes, I'm a native, born and raised in San Francisco, um, still live here. Very rare to, to find us here, but um, an honor. Um, and glad to work in the city that I, I grew up in. I went to low high school here and studied at San Francisco State University where I have a background in engineering, how I got into social justice. Lord only knows, he places you Minus where chemistry, so. <laughs> He said, you will be a designer of people systems, right? Instead of um, industrial design. So um, again, it's it's been, this is truly God's work and it's been a blessing to be here. I've been involved with Success Centers um, for over 32 years. I was one of the founding staff um, and Success Centers was started um, 38 years ago by superior court judges who saw the need to provide alternative education and workforce development services um, to the young men who were returning to the county from uh, Log Cabin Ranch, which is our county's long, was our county's long-term detention facility. It's been since shut down um, three years ago, yay. And um, we continue to do the work though, um, focusing on marginalized communities um, and so today we have, we're located in um, three counties, five detention facilities, and where we have a school, we have a school program called the Early Morning Studies Academy that we do in partnership with Jarmia Charter. We run, we, blah, 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 we run one of the leading career um, centers in San Francisco. Um, we're also located in San Mateo County and in Alameda County, um, where we're connected with um, eight other schools within the, among the three counties. So we're really proud of the work and the expansion that we've made um, over the decades. So really proud of that. Definitely, yeah. And I didn't mention, so I am a board member, proud board member of Success Centers. And I share. <laughs> I definitely joined at the height of, you know, those uh, mergers and acquisitions that you're talking about. And it's been fun to see the expansion across the Bay because it used to be Success Centers of San Francisco and now, you know, focusing We're on regional. Yeah, so that's, that's exciting to see and, uh, you know, CBE community is definitely all across the Bay. So I think there's a nice way for everyone to eventually get involved too. Absolutely. Um, and it's so apropos because um, 
as you know, the African American population in San Francisco has dwindled down to, I think it's down to about 2%. I think so. And, and most of our folks have migrated out into the surrounding counties. So we're pleased to be able to continue to be of service there. As Robin indicated, we did four mergers last year which is kind of indicative of what's going on in the nonprofit community. Shoot us, huh? But we survived. <laughs> um, and it's really, we've had a tremendous um, growth trajectory. When I started, when I came back to success centers for, and this is my third regime, because I was line staff and I've been a funder of success centers when I um, was director of community programs for the juvenile probation department. Um, I've been the board chair and now as the CEO, first ever, because we always kind of function as this quasi-government organization. Um, when I came back, it was my task to make it a standalone nonprofit, and I think we've done that. We had less than a uh, half a million dollar budget, and now over the, the past few years, we've um, that budget has grown um, tenfold. Um, to $4.1 million and um, connected in all these surrounding counties and, you know, in all these different um, detention facilities. So this inside out model has really been strategic um, and ideal so that we can meet folks inside detention where hopefully they're thinking about how to rehabilitate themselves, connecting with them there and meeting them in community where we help them um, get connected within our construction training program. We do training in tech. We do, we have our school program, as I mentioned before. We also connect people in healthcare, hospitality, and a new area of cannabis. So, um, yeah, cannabis industry, and we're we're one of the leaders um, in getting people connected, as well as connecting them to um, enabling them to incubate businesses. So it's a, it's a little different trajectory for us, but we're real proud to be in that space. Thanks for mentioning that. So yeah, I think that's one of the cool things when you think about success centers. You you mentioned you know the mission is really about workforce development, education, and empowerment through employment and the arts. Um, you go by share. <laughs> <laughs> I know our mission. Um, <laughs> so I think it's awesome too because you all have great partnerships with a lot of Bay Area employers, um, you know, when you do also do career spotlights and the career center, you know, when it was fully functioning too, you would bring in those employers physically yes. and now I've gone to a digital space. Um, and so you mentioned also the cannabis program, which is definitely huge. You know, you and Angela are often in the, the news for that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, that program and why equity in the cannabis space is a focal point? Yes. So we, this idea actually came from some of our transitional age youth, um, where right as we were beginning to think about these mergers and headed along this tremendous growth trajectory, we led our young people through a sticky wall activity um, and asked them, what are you and your friends going to need in the next five years to be successful? And they um, indicated that they, you know, needed a safe space, that they want to be connected to adults who um, are, could mentor them in careers that they saw themselves being involved in. It was cool, the jobs we were getting them in retail or fast food or what have you, but they really wanted to be on a career path, a career trajectory. And um, they listed all those um, industries that I just mentioned, construction, healthcare, hospitality, the arts, tech, and cannabis. And so everybody laughed when this one young man said, you know, I want to own my own cannabis business and I want you to, you know, it would be great if you guys could help us get there. And everybody laughed, you just want to get high all day. But I was curious about, well, what in the industry are you interested in, you know, pursuing? And he said that he wanted to be a cultivator. He wanted to learn mm -hmm. how to grow. And at that time, it, it was legal medicinally, but it wasn't legal yet for recreational use. So the first thing we did was, okay, you want to learn how to grow? We got a grant from Public Utilities Commission to learn how to um, grow, but not 
marijuana we grew and i had to threaten them you grow anything in these flower boxes other than flowers and vegetables i'm gonna have to kill you <laughs> but they learned how to you know they they put together some amazing hydroponic systems from just things that were around the office they took alhambra water jugs and turned them into alhambra into uh, hydroponic systems using hemp to water the plants um, and they created another one out of a cve pipe and dixie cups and water bottles i mean incredible things just with elements from around the office but it taught them to learn how to to um, grow and then they volunteered at some of the local um, neighborhood uh, farms um, but then that also started you know our thinking about how to get into this industry we knew it was going to be legal and we, this would be our response to the war on drugs. So when the year before it became um, recreational, um, we put in a proposal to the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. It ranks number one, um, but it wasn't funded. I don't know if the city was too prudish to uh, step into that realm or I'd like to say they didn't have their systems together yet and was, we were a little ahead of our time. Um, so, but the board um, allowed us to continue to pursue and fund um, what we thought we were just going to be placing people in jobs. Um, but this has turned into an opportunity to not only um, create a space in the industry for our folks where we have been persecuted for forever um, around and so many people have been persecuted and the folks that we care most about has been in ordinance about a time in jail for um, the sale of, of, of marijuana. And so here's our opportunity to right the wrong. And so not only are we putting folks to work, but we're helping equity um, incubators learn how to develop their business from you know the street vernacular that they might use um, or the street um, acumen to a real business professional acumen and knowing that it's not joints for pre-rolls and learning the lingo and um, being able to operate cash only uh, businesses and understanding what it takes to market a cannabis which all the rules are totally different in this space than in any other industry and it's highly regulated so we work together with the um, equity or cannabis businesses to come in to help teach our folks about what it's like to run businesses here and encourage them to help to incubate um, those that want to go into business. And then we're also providing uh, compliance in, um, on the city level because they don't have a connection to the job seekers or the incubators and they're trying to hold these businesses accountable. So we also support that with first source hiring, um, helping them to get their jobs out because all of them have to, if you're going to sell recreationally, 35% of your workforce got to be um, equity verified. Um, or you can help incubate a company that needs to be X. So we help with all that verification and compliance and stuff. So um, we didn't expect to get all the publicity we are getting, but it's kind of cool. When we made it to Forbes magazine in high times, it was like, oh my God, we've arrived. <laughs> and it's amazing because thinking back, you know, one of my thesis papers from college was the legalization of marijuana. And who would have thought 40 years later, it's Leo. Supporting that, yeah. Right, so it's, again, God is so amazing. He puts you where he wants you to be. I think that's awesome. And I, I love that you mentioned, you know, if you think about how Success Center started um, and you're working with youth who have been in detention centers and essentially probably some of them could have been detained for, you know, 80% of them, 80% of the young people that we work with have been detained for crimes of an economic nature, 80%. So poetic justice, huh? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> we like to think so. <laughs> That's beautiful. So I um, thank you for sharing about the equity program. I think that's amazing. And we definitely don't want black and brown people left out of this no. industry as you know, it is being commercialized. Um, so it's, it's nice to see that Success Centers has 
a huge place in um, giving everybody the resources to be a part of that industry as it grows. Yes, we're still working. It's still, you know, again, it's a difficult, it's new, yeah. it's budding, um, <laughs> but we're still working really hard to try to make sure that equity, um, and I think a lot of municipalities are trying to be very thoughtful about it, but I, again, we're still working to make sure that you know, black and brown people, particularly th those who have been persecuted, have an equal stake, uh, an equitable stake yep. um, in this industry uh, like no others. You know, we've been pushed. If you look at tech, you know, women and people of color, you don't see them very prevalent in those industries. And we want to make sure here that, you know, we're up front and center. Yeah. Thank you. So just to shift a little bit, obviously we're doing this virtually, um, and I know a lot of the programs that Success Centers um, hosts are also virtual. Can you talk a little bit about, like, especially the construction program, can you talk about, you know, how you all have pivoted your coding program um, to still serve the needs of your community during this Yes. Day? Well, we never, we never closed in the COVID because we know that home is not safe for most of our constituents. You know, if you're living in a homeless shelter and you have to leave the facility at six in the morning and can't return till six in the evening, where do you, where do you shelter in place? Yeah. Well, if you're engaged in success center, you can come there. So um, in the San Francisco, um, we have a huge warehouse that we operate our school and our construction and tech programs out of. And um, the first thing we did was learn how to be safe because we wanted to make sure no, we weren't you know, affecting or infecting anybody. Right. So we learned to and taught our participants and ourselves to, to be safe, to cleanse, how do we COVID cleanse? That's a job now. They're COVID cleaners in almost every industry now. Um, so I'm glad we learned to do that because we placed a lot of people in some of those jobs. Um, mm -hmm. And so then we had to learn how to socially distance. And um, then we had to move all of our curriculum into a virtual space. And thank God for the young people in our tech program because they helped us to quickly figure out the tools we needed to use and how to move our curriculum onto learning management systems and so forth. So we spent the first, but we immediately tried to figure out, got on Zoom and started figuring out. We got Zoom bomb for the first couple of weeks. <laughs> but we figured it out. Oh, it was ugly. But we moved our, first we moved our cannabis um, program. We had an um, entrepreneurship training program. That was the first program that moved on to, into the virtual space. Um, and we also do support groups and uh, we had our NA group, they moved as, as well quickly. But all of our curriculum now is offered on a learning management platform, even our construction program. And we just limited the number of people in our space so that we could socially distance. But to, to learn our, um, our construction training is done by teaching people the basic trades by building tiny houses. So the theoretical component of it was not taught in the classroom anymore. It was taught in the virtual space. But we have handfuls of people coming in and actually getting the practicum by building tiny houses. It's still really cool. Um, and... You know, so it's it's been tough. We've all had to learn how to pivot. The first thing, another huge, obvious divide for our folks was making sure they had the technology they needed to be able to function in the virtual space. I don't think many of us are ever going to go back to brick and mortar. Yeah. This is the new normal. And for, again, the folks we care most about, they were functioning. We had to make sure in the least they had a smartphone so that they could be able to access our workshops and connect with our case managers and participate in the employer spotlights like you talked about to connect with the employers. Um, but we took all the laptops we had and we're still looking for laptops, wink, wink, hint, hint, um, to be able to pass out to our constituents. And then there's a, the problem with Wi-Fi. Um, many of our young people are you know, trying to latch on the Wi-Fi signals or hotspots by sitting in the parking lots of Starbucks or Burger King. And that's, that's not how that's we should sustainable. Yeah. 
it should be available for everybody, especially now that we're forced into this new normal. So, but we figured it out. Um, and for those that didn't have access, we still open up our facilities and have um, computer labs and things that they could use, but still it's a very limited capacity. Right. Um, yeah. So we're working toward that as well too, bridging that divide. So you kind of helped segue into, um, you know, my final question, if you will, is I think a large part of what's going on now or a large part of your work is making sure that constituents have access to the resources they need so they can thrive, so they can be, you know, self-sufficient. Um, what, what are the ways, especially when we're thinking of the CBE community, you know, is it volunteerism? How can we support? How can people get involved? How can they learn more? What, what is the best way to connect people with success centers? Well, we are always seeking folks time, treasure, and talents. Um, you know, to come in and mentor um, an individual who is trying to get their business off the ground or mentor a young person who might be struggling with math. And to have a person that looks like you who can help you speaks volumes. Yeah. Um, your talents. We're always looking for folks who can, you know, help us. We, we, we pride ourselves in being innovative and taking those risks and living on the fringes because we, we kind of have to because normal systems did not work and do not work and have pushed out our folks. Um, and so we pride ourselves in being innovative in our programming and our delivery of services. And so, you know, helping us to one of the challenges now is we're being asked asked to come to uh, Bayview Hunters Point to provide our services. And I couldn't even have a phone call up there because the signal dropped. But then I learned that there's Google Fiber up there, but the community doesn't have access to it. You know, working with mm -hmm. us on strategy to make sure that every single household in these um, now privately owned affordable housing properties have access. That's criminal. Um, and helping us put together campaigns where we can, you know, obtain laptops that our, our tech program can refurbish and pass out to folks who may not be, um, have that capacity. Um, you know, volunteerism, board service is always um, good. And then we will not turn that down that hard cold dollar either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we need the cash to be able to, you know, continue to be innovative, think outside the box. Our government contracts do not fund innovation. They just fund the services that we provide. But we have to remain cutting edge. we got to continue to pioneer new industries like the cannabis industries um, and do that in such a way that um, allows us to be what our constituents need us to be our employer partners or our job seekers or um, entrepreneurs need to be. So those are all ways um, that you can contribute. Um, yeah. And you are, we're always work, welcome if you passing out our jobs to other job seekers or getting you, your employer to list their jobs with us are all good ways. Um, for more information, you can always go to successcenters.org or text us at 228-28 to type in success centers and we'll get right in contact with you. Thank you. You covered all the hot spots. So I think there are many opportunities many, for many. our communities to support one another, which is what this is all about. So really uh, talent and treasure. We'll take yeah. it <laughs> so you heard that if you're listening out there, um, please get in contact with Liz and her team at Success Centers to support their the work that they're doing, to donate your time, talent and treasures, and you know, see what's going on and how you can make an impact there. So any yes. final thoughts, Liz, that you want to leave everyone with before we wrap up? I'm just very, again, I'm just so proud of the Coalition on Black Excellence for hosting these vignettes and allowing us to share our stories. Um, I'm very grateful um, to this opportunity and um, uh, thank you for your time. And um, thank yes, you. keep us posted on all the good work that you do. We will. Thank you, Liz, so much Thank for you. joining us. And again, for all the work that you're doing with Success Centers, just to really make sure that the next generation um, has a space. Uh
um, and it has a piece of the opportunities that are that we know are out there for us. Yes. So um, continue, continue to do the good work that you're doing in this community. And for those listening, thank you for joining us for the spotlight. Um, if you have any questions, reach out um, to either someone at CBE or like Liz said, you can get in contact with Success Center. So thank, thank you. you so much. All right. <laughs> Keep empowering Black lives. Yes. Thanks for listening to the Coalition of Black Excellence Spotlight Series, where we aim to build, promote, and inspire. To learn more, visit cbenonprofit.org.